Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 27. And so I was looking for a passage for our communion reflection and trying to tie in everything that has uh, been mentioned in our messages the past couple of weeks as well as continuing to move forward and what it means to suffer, uh, what it means for God's children to suffer uh, in this world. I thought this would be an appropriate passage for us today as we're going to begin to look at what it means to suffer for Christ. And so this will be the beginning of one or two more messages about what it means to be uh, God's children who live for Him and proclaim the gospel message and may endure suffering and persecution. <coughs> now, why that happens and how we are to respond in that. So this morning I'd like to read for you verses 24 through 27 as we briefly begin this time of God's Word study, suffering for Christ. Believers expect to suffer for Christ. Verse 24. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but now is but is now disclosed to the saints. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. <coughs> Suffering for Christ. There's a story that was shared by uh, Michael Card, a famous Christian musician. He was at a rally for Billy Graham many years ago at one of his crusades, and he shared this story about a man, a, a, man, a man named Joseph, a Maasai warrior in Africa. This is Joseph's story. Listen very carefully to this, but it is going to be a hard story to listen to. One day Joseph, who was walking along one of these hot, dirty African roads, met someone who shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with him. Then and there he accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. The power of the Spirit began transforming his life. He was filled with such excitement and joy that the first thing he wanted to do was return to his own village and share that same good news with the members of his local tribe. Joseph began going from door to door, telling everyone he met about the cross of Jesus and the salvation it offered, expecting to see their faces light up the way his had. To his amazement, the villagers not only didn't care, they became violent. The men of the village seized him and held him to the ground while the women beat him with strands of barbed wire. He was dragged from the village and left to die alone in the bush. Joseph somehow managed to crawl to a water hole and there, after days of passing in and out of consciousness, found the strength to get up. He wondered about the hostile, he wondered about the hostile reception he had received from people he had known all his life. He decided he must have left something out or told the story of Jesus incorrectly. After rehearsing the message he had first heard, he decided to go back and share his faith once more. Joseph limped into the circle of huts and began to proclaim Jesus. He died for you so that you might find forgiveness and come to know the living God, he pleaded. Again, he was grabbed by the men of the village and held while the women beat him, reopening wounds that had just begun to heal. Once more, they dragged him unconscious from the village and left him to die. To have survived the first beating was truly remarkable. To live through the second was a miracle. Again, days later, Joseph awoke in the wilderness, bruised, scarred, and determined <laughs> to go back. He returned to the small village, and this time they attacked him before he had a chance to open his mouth. As they flogged him for the third and probably the last time, he, began, he again spoke to them of Jesus Christ. The Lord. Before he passed out, the last thing he saw was that the women who were beating him began to weep. This time he awoke in his own bed. The ones who had so severely beaten him were now trying to save his life and nurse him back to health. The entire village had come to Jesus Christ. Amen. Isn't that a wonderful story? Yes. That is just a tremendous, <coughs> tremendous story of what happens when believers suffer for the name of Christ. Now, it's not always that the people who persecute believers always come to faith in Christ. It doesn't always happen, but it does happen. 
quite often. There are many, many such stories. And this is part of what Paul is referring to when he says in verse 24, I rejoice in what was suffered for you. And I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. Suffering for Christ results in three things I see here in this passage this morning. First of all, it results, suffering for Christ results in rejoicing. The first part of verse 24. Now I rejoice, the Apostle Paul says, in what was suffered for you. Not just what Christ endured for their salvation, but also what was suffered because of the gospel being proclaimed to the Colossians. Paul didn't necessarily bring the gospel to the churches in Colossae, but someone he knew did, and he was writing to them, and he is referring to what happened upon their reception, their hearing of the gospel. He rejoiced that he endured suffering like Christ did, that others were suffering because of the gospel, and even though it came to them, and yet they responded, even though it was difficult. He was told during his conversion experience that he would suffer greatly for Jesus. Jesus said to uh, the man that he had called to come and help heal Paul from the blindness that he received, <coughs> that he's going to know how much he's going to suffer for my name. Paul, the great persecutor of the church, had now become the great evangelist of the church. Everywhere Paul went, he suffered because of the fact he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going to look more at that next week. We read of Paul's immense suffering in the book of Acts in 1st and 2nd Corinthians and Philippians. There was nothing that he didn't endure because he preached Jesus as the one and only Savior for Jews and Gentiles, for the whole world. But Paul was not alone in this rejoicing and suffering. The early apostles, Peter, James, and uh, John also suffered for the name of Christ early on after that uh, initial day of Pentecost. Healing, preaching, proclaiming the name of Christ. And they were drawn, uh, brought before the ruling council, the same council that condemned Jesus to crucifixion by the Romans. They ordered them not to teach in the name of Jesus. They flogged them, put them in prison, but yet these men rejoiced. They were encouraged. They praised God and they suffered for the name of Jesus. And they kept right on obeying Jesus, even though it meant they were going to suffer physically. We rejoice in our sufferings. Paul says in Romans 5, 3 through 5, that these sufferings for Christ produce perseverance and hope and character. James says in chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, that we should have joy when we face various trials and testings because of our faith. Rejoice. When was the last time we rejoiced because we suffered for Christ? I know some of you have shared with me in the past and with the church that at work it's hard to be the only Christian or one of the few. One of the few who don't, doesn't participate in some of the other activities of your co-workers. Some of you here are in families in which you are one of the few who know Christ as Savior. And don't participate in sometimes to do a ridicule from family members and loved ones. Because you know Christ. Because you live for Christ. Because you stand <coughs> upon His word. And you don't back down. You're not mean and ugly about proclaiming Christ or living for Christ. You're just doing what you think you know is best according to God's word. What you've been taught and trained to do and led by the Spirit to do. But yet you suffer. I don't know if anyone here who has suffered physically being beaten for sharing the gospel of Christ. If that has happened to you, I do want to hear about that. We need to hear about that and to encourage you and to rejoice with you because you, in sharing the gospel, have suffered in the name of Christ. Rejoice in your sufferings, especially for your sufferings for Christ. Suffering for Christ also results in more believers. In the second half of in the middle part of verse 24, Paul says, I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. It's a strange phrase. It makes it sound like Jesus didn't suffer enough. Some people have actually taught that. That is incorrect. The word afflictions doesn't mean the same type of suffering as suffering persecution, like being beaten 
for a particular reason. This word afflictions here is a word that talks about everyday struggles, trials, and distresses. Can't remember what you did or what you wanted to do when you walked into the room or you know, just the aches and pains of life. You know, these general things just happen because we're alive and in a sinful world. The word for affliction is never used of Jesus in his death. It's a general word used for trouble or distress or trials for others, of others. Paul is stating that unbelievers can see what he endures for Christ. And in seeing what he endures because of Christ... They see Christ suffering for them. So he fills up what they could not see because they were not there at the cross. How many of you were there at the cross? None of us were there at the cross. Very few who actually walked away as witnesses. There was very few of them. But these apostles and other evangelists, prophets of the New Testament, throughout the book of Acts, they were putting Christ on display. And as they suffered... In doing so, in sharing the gospel, they were showing others what Christ did do for them on their behalf, that they might see and believe in Jesus as Savior. And there would be more believers. The church would grow. Essentially, those who persecuted Paul and other believers, they did so because they couldn't get to Jesus himself. And so they attacked his followers. And that's what happens today. It's not us necessarily that they have a problem with, but we're the ones who are proclaiming the message that they have a problem with. And so they attack us because we proclaim the message of Jesus, the one that they really have a problem with. God in His unique and awesome plan turns the evil intentions of Satan and those who hate the gospel around for good in His glory and bringing many to Christ because of the suffering of His church. When unbelievers, sometimes even the very persecutors themselves, see how believers endure suffering because of their faith in Christ, they too surrender to Christ and place their faith and trust in Him. Think of the Philippian jailer who believed in Christ after hearing Paul and Silas sing songs throughout the night. And after he thought that they had escaped after an earthquake, he was ready to take his own life because it was going to happen anyway, so it might as well go easily, he thought. But they stop him, and he asks, how can I know this God, this Jesus that you sing about, even after I beat you and whipped you and almost broke your legs, putting your legs in the skies? How can you sing and rejoice in your suffering? I want to know the God that can do that for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 5 Actually, 6 is the key verse here for us at this point. Paul says, If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and for your salvation, that you might see Christ and His sufferings in us. Believers suffering for Christ results in rejoicing, not only themselves, but the church as well. More believers coming to faith in Christ. And also, lastly here, looking at the rest of verse 24 through 27. A stronger church. A stronger church. Paul says that he rejoiced in the suffering and he filled up what was lacking for the sake of his body, Christ's body, for the sake of the church. Paul completes his mission. And so do we when we continue through suffering to share the gospel of Paul knew that if he suffered, the church would suffer too. But not just the church, though. Christ also suffered and suffers with his church. He is with us through all of this. There have been many stories that have come out of closed countries. North Korea, China, many of the former Soviet bloc countries in Central Asia were believers who have been thrown into prison. They've been beaten and whipped and they just sense this overwhelming presence with them as they endure the beatings and the scourgings and other tortures for Christ. This has been written in countless books. So many that it can't be, and so many people who didn't even know each other sharing the same thing. It cannot be but truth that they are experiencing God's, Christ's comfort and presence among them, strengthening them to endure 
But it's more than just that. As we suffer, as we struggle, as we share and encourage with each other, as we proclaim the gospel message that everyone throughout the whole world, regardless of where they live, where they grew up, how rich or poor they are, man or woman, <coughs> child or adult, anyone can come to faith in Christ. He is the only way. We are strengthening the church. Not only by adding more believers, but by showing one another how to stand firm through the persecution that we may endure, the sufferings that we may endure. Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, Paul says, It has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for Him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now here that I still have. He was in prison when he wrote Philippians. He was in prison when he wrote Colossians. And not a nice little house arrest prison. He was in a pit. A sewage pit. And he's rejoicing in his sufferings. And he's calling the Philippians. And he's calling the Colossians. And all of us to rejoice in our sufferings. Understanding that it brings more believers into the church. And that it strengthens the church as we suffer for Christ. He says again in Philippians, I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings, becoming like Him. We become a stronger church because, through suffering because we are enduring what Christ endured. We will become more like Him because we will know what He, more of what he endured for us. <coughs> a sharing of suffering can bring rejoicing, encouragement, Joy shared is multiplied. Sorrow shared is diminished. So we can help each other through the sufferings that we endure as we share these with one another. We rejoice in our sufferings because we know also that it produces perseverance, character, and hope. Stronger Christians. Stronger Christians, stronger churches. Stronger Christians and churches, stronger evangelistic outreach, regardless of the cause. We've talked a lot in the past couple of weeks about the sovereignty of God, how Jesus, how God is reigning on high. And He even allows us to endure sufferings like Job went through, what Joseph went through, the Joseph of the Old, Old Testament. Jacob's favorite son. All that he endured, God brought it all about for good, for his glory, for the salvation and redemption of men. And he can do the same with the sufferings that we endure because we know Christ, because we love Christ, because we live for Christ, and because we share Christ. And I know that in our little corner of Wisconsin, there might not be a lot of beatings for knowing Christ. We have relative freedom as we come and gather together. We're not afraid of what might happen because we're here today. But that can also make us soft, complacent, and lazy, timid about sharing the gospel because we don't want to shake up this awful, awesome, wonderful thing. I was trying to make awesome and wonderful in one word. Or something like that. Awesome, wonderful thing that we have. We don't want to jeopardize it. But if we don't share the gospel, if we don't proclaim Christ, we're going to lose it and much more. <coughs> we must be willing to suffer for the name of Christ. Sharing the gospel. Being willing to say to an employer, I'm not going to work on Sunday because I need to be with my church. I need to be fed. I need to be filled. And I know for some that's very difficult. And I'm not saying that you have to, but there's no reason to not. Try. It might bring ridicule upon you. For students to say to their teachers or their coaches, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. I love this team and I want this group, whatever it might be. And I want to see it succeed and I want to give my very best. But Jesus gets my best first. We need students who will stand up and do that at all levels. Teachers who will stand up and do that with their schools and say, hey, we're taking time away from our students. And one of the most valuable things that they could ever have their spiritual life. Why suffering? Because it helps believers grow closer to Christ. It can also assure believers of their salvation. Because Jesus said, the world hates me and so it will hate you if you follow me. 2 Timothy and 1 Peter reflect the same idea. If we know Christ, 
we expect to experience. We love Christ, we can expect to experience what He endured as well. Being like Christ will make us stick out our worldview, our way of voting, our way of standing up for certain things in our society, of saying no to certain things in our society, our lifestyles. Even being married in 21st century America will get you ridiculed. Married to opposite gender. Just mention that you believe in the Bible and what it teaches about marriage, sexuality, and other things that are in our culture today. People are just destroying. And you will stick out and you will endure ridicule for Christ. Believers have a future reward. The Apostle Paul says that what we endure here will be multiplied and magnified for our glory in eternity. Jesus said, those who have left everything and follow me will receive hundred times more what they have left behind to follow me. There is great reward in knowing and following Christ and even enduring suffering for his name. And of course, as we've already seen through the story at the beginning and throughout the message already, believers' examples lead others to Christ. And that's what we want. That should be the most important thing, the most high on our list. Seeing people come to know Christ, no matter the cost. Are we as a church willing to go there, as individuals and as a ministry? Are we willing to stand for Christ even if it means we lose this wonderful, beautiful building. Even if it means we lose our tax-exempt status. Even if it means we have to meet in basements or in a community center. Are we willing to stand for Christ and say, this is what God's Word says. And I'm going to, we are going to, live by this, come what may. I hope and pray that we are that church. We haven't experienced a lot of pushback in our community yet. And maybe that means we're not getting out there enough to get some pushback. I'm not saying that we need to bring it on, but we need to not be afraid to have it brought on as well. To stand firm in the gospel, to be willing and courageous, bold in sharing the gospel for Jesus Christ. Love Jesus Christ for those who need to believe. And standing firm upon his word, the truth. Expect to suffer for Christ. Share the gospel. Stand against the wickedness in our culture. We're going to look at how we can do that as believers in the coming months here, especially before the election, as people are going to be talking about this. What is that going to mean for us? How do we do that in a way that honors Christ? Are we ready? Are we willing to suffer for Christ? Let's pray. Father, this morning we thank you for this reminder. We thank you for what your Son, Jesus, our Savior, has endured on our behalf, that we might know you, be your sons and daughters, have forgiveness, be reconciled to you, have re eternal life, have hope through the sufferings that we endure in this world because we know Christ and just because it's a sinful, evil world. <coughs> Father, I pray that you would give us courage, give us boldness to stand firmly upon your word. Help us to know it, to spend time in it, to spend time together encouraging one another to be bold and sharing and living for Christ. And as we endure suffering, may we share that together. Not as badges of honor, but as a way of encouraging and strengthening one another to keep moving forward. Come what may. And in all of that, Father, we pray that Christ would be honored and glorified. That people would come to faith in your church would grow in strength. Guide us, direct us, empower us, we pray in Jesus' name.